Hello, I'm Susan Lambert, host of the podcast series, In the Balance, connecting mind, body, and heart. On June 11th, 2018, we held our very first live In the Balance panel discussion in New York City, Relationships in the 21st Century, Discovering the Pathway to True Love. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Polly Young Eisendrath, is a renowned Jungian psychoanalyst, mindfulness teacher, practicing Buddhist since 1971, and a prolific author of 16 books. Polly opens the evening with her keynote address, The Journey from Personal Love to True Love. We then dive into a discussion on how the beloved can become an enemy, the intoxication of falling in love and what comes after romance, and the hows and whys of forging the path to a lasting, deeply loving relationship. Our panelists, art therapist and yoga teacher Liza Toft, her husband, author and journalist Marcus Barham, and the award-winning radio show host and performer Walker Vreeland are wonderfully honest. The audience asks challenging questions and Polly radiates with grace, wisdom, humor, and deep knowledge. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Relationships in the 21st Century. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank all of you for being here. And I hope that what I say to you is helpful to you personally. And uh, please do all that you can to both try to sort of take it in without worrying about the details, and then ask me questions. Um, I won't make this too burdensome, I think, but uh, I want to start out with uh, one of my sort of great uh, inspiring mentors, Leonard Cohen, uh, the Canadian bard, uh, you know, who says that uh, love is a cold and broken hallelujah. So I like to put that in the forefront because I'm afraid too often people believe that they should be good at it instead of recognizing that everybody's bad at it. You know, and I, I prefer the opening that comes through uh, recognizing that we have this common and shared suffering that we came here through love and love is the biggest challenge and nobody does it well so I, I wanted to get that out of the way at the <laughs> beginning so that you know that I also you know have starter marriages and breakups in my life and adult children who confront me and lots of other things that go on in my life that let me know that there is a way to move through the brokenness, but it's universal. And if you become ashamed or you feel bad about your own path of love, it'll keep you closed. And that won't be the way to go. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I, good. So uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, and I'm going to try to do it in a way that both makes sense and goes through a kind of arc of development, uh, is what I call personal love which is the love that we take personally. You know, I mean, uh, in the past, there was a kind of division between what people would consider universal or transpersonal love, and uh, like the love of God, and then personal love, which would be the stuff that you muck around in in your ordinary life. And I actually believe that those two come together on the path now of what I would call love between equals, and that this is the kind of couple love of the 21st century, and I'm going to spend a little time talking about what that kind of love looks like, but I, I want you to think of it in a number of ways. One is that what I will be talking about will be any kind of love that has that kind of eye to eye uh, or that sense that we're equals, so it can be a love between an adult child and a parent an adult child who's supposed to be an equal, a grown-up, uh, and the parent who's supposed to be an equal and a grown-up. 
and uh, also love between siblings, love between friends, but I'm going to talk specifically of love between partners, people who fall in love and get together out of that particular framework. Uh, most kinds of love uh, begin with a kind of falling in love. That's true of the parent-child relationship and can often be true also of siblings and certainly of friends. And uh, when we fall in love, there's a kind of idealization that happens that, uh, let's just talk about it in terms of couples. Uh, you know, you, you look into the mirror of your beloved's eyes and you think, well, I'm the fairest one in the land because this person has all these tremendously idealizing feelings about me. And then similarly, that person, if it's all working well and the chemistry is there, looks at you and feels like you're conveying I'm the fairest in the land. So the two get together out of what I would call as a kind of psychotic projection, you know? <laughs> they, they think they're the fairest in the land and they think they've got it together. And actually that's very intoxicating. And if you, if you haven't experienced it, you probably would like to experience it. And if you have experienced it, you know that it's intoxicating. And uh, um, so I'm gonna leave it at that and say that falling in love is the way that people want to get together these days. And so they're getting together through projection. And projection really is this sense that I see you, I know you, I know what you're bringing, I know who you are when you haven't checked it out. You know? And so in a certain way you could say, when you make an idealizing projection, you put the person on a pedestal. And so, of course, they have to fall because they're human. And they're also putting you on a pedestal. Uh, we also begin with an idealizing projection into our babies. You know, we say basically, oh, you're sort of wonderful, amazing, incredible, etc. It's got to go south from there. I mean, it's not going to work. <laughs> so um, we all begin with this tremendous sort of hope. And unfortunately, I think in this period of time in the 21st century, we put an awful lot uh, on the I'm going to get the right person part of the formula. People spend years and years looking for the right person, looking for the person who's going to be the perfect mate. So if you could recognize that that's impossible, it might give you a clue, you know, that things aren't going to go smoothly. Uh, as Alice Neal, the painter, said, you know, life is not a picnic on the grass. And uh, it really, she could have said relationship is not a picnic on the grass. And like Leonard Cohen, that, that love is a, is a very broken hallelujah. So if you keep that in mind, then you can go through the idealizing phase of it, recognizing that it's going to turn into power struggle and disillusionment. And it's going to turn into this other thing, which is harder to describe which is that you're going to create a, an enemy in your beloved, a, a kind of intimate enemy. And that is because that person will fail. That person will fail to be the ideal. And in the way that this disillusionment happens, it usually seems very personal these days. So uh, in the 21st century, we got three wishes about love. I, I like to say this because I think it's true. Number one, we, we wanted to choose somebody that we fell in love with, someone that we desire, someone who doesn't necessarily come from our tribe, our background. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, parents and grandparents chose for us, and now we're not doing that. It's very individualistic. We're going to choose somebody uh, that we fall in love with. The second part of the desire is that we are going to be equals. We're going to have a relationship of mutuality and equality and reciprocity and our ideals are around that. And uh, um, we expect, once we choose this beloved, that we're going to operate in this reciprocal and mutual way. The third wish is that we wanted a witness. We wanted somebody who could see us for who we are. Someone, I mean, I think it's the very nature of love that you love the beloved and you see the beloved because you know the beloved. And everybody wants to be accepted. They want to be accepted actually without changing a hair on the head. 
you know. And so just check out how well do you do that with the people around you. You know, the tendency in all of us is to want to be loved as ourselves, with our limitations, with our difficulties and our strengths, and so to be known as individuals, to be accepted deeply. And um, I don't want to diverge too much into this, but this is the way that people in the past, and some people still, wanted God to love them in a personal way. To know you well, to accept you deeply, would be the love of God. So now we're asking other people to do this for us. You know, It's not God anymore. <laughs> it's somebody sitting across the table from you. So you put those three things together that you are going to choose a stranger that you're going to fall in love with and then you're going to be mutual and equal and reciprocal and then you're going to actually expect the mirror image to be accepted and they're going to know you over time and accept you with your limitations well you know fat chance that it's going to go well it's just not going to go well so then what has to happen next if we're going to make so you know you could say well okay this is a setup and we've and we've done it to ourselves we've set ourselves up this way uh, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing and I really don't know but uh, the one thing I can say is that it's a different thing this has not been the case ever in regard to marriage particularly marriage has always been a relationship that is something like a corporation it was to keep the family going over time, to keep the wealth in the family, and also to make a promise that was impersonal until death do us part. You know, it doesn't matter if I really like you after years, you know, I have to be with you. And in the past, for the stealthiest and the wealthiest, they could go elsewhere outside of the marriage. Now, because of all of our issues around wanting the mutuality, equality, and the friendship, and the honesty, and so on, we don't like that. We don't like the attachment bond to be broken. That creates a kind of distrust that is profound for people. When, when somebody betrays you, in your personal love these days, it feels terrible and actually can become a reason why you actually get sick, either physically or emotionally sick. And so to some extent, given the period of time, the divorce rate, which is slightly over 50% for on average for first time marriages and slightly above 65% for remarriages. So marriage is a weak bond in the atmosphere that we're in right now. The divorce rate in some ways is a sign of health that people are willing to get out when they're feeling terrible. So this, um, this idea that we could be married to someone's equal, mutual, the mirroring, the witnessing, and anybody we want to is a very strange idea. And uh, it's very much of our period of time, a very individualistic period of time in an individualistic culture here. So, you know, is this good news, is this bad news? Well, it can be good news if we learn to work with a certain kind of conflict skillfully because possibly we will learn to work with conflict skillfully. Possibly that will go out into society and culture. We'll gain some skills and we'll be able then to deal with a certain kind of sense of brokenness and disappointment in others, especially when we have high ideals and those high ideals lead us to blame and shame. And those are the kinds of problems human beings have everywhere. They have those problems. And if we can do it in our personal relationships, possibly those skills will translate out into society. This is my hope anyway for the 21st century that you really want to learn these skills at home because you don't want to break off. You don't want to break off in your deep attachment relationships. It's painful, very painful to lose a deep attachment relationship, whether it's marriage or children or whatever. So in a certain way, this new style of relationship and marriage in the 21st century gives us a big new opportunity. And that is the opportunity to create a mindful space, what I'm going to call a mindful gap, between self and other in which a deep inquiry can be made. And that inquiry has to be along the lines of, let me speak for myself, not for you, 
and let me find out what is going on with you. And number one, let me really be able to feel my own feelings and my own experience without discharging them into the relationship. And number two, let me be able to project into you all of the Mishigas that is in me, but then to be able to take it back responsibly, not to leave it in you. Because whether it's an adult child, a partner, a friend or a sibling, what happens in this time where there is tremendous disillusionment, we create this sense of an enemy and then we could leave it out there and then we try to control the other person to actually shape up the situation. Oh, you seem so depressed. Maybe you could go to a meditation retreat or, oh, yes, I see you have a problem with eating. Could I suggest that you blah, blah, blah. This is the thing that creates terrible animosity, humiliation, difficulty between ourselves and the beloveds around us. And it is the hardest thing because as soon as you are with somebody whose future also will affect you, you know, and their behavior will affect you, and uh, it's very hard then to actually do for them what you might do for your neighbor, which is create the space in which you say basically, you know, I see you, I'm so glad you exist, and I'm not gonna ask you to stop smoking. That's your business. Now, that is a very big jump to make. And if we can do this, if we can work with this enemy business that gets going between us and a beloved, whether again, it's the adult child, it's the, the reason I say it's the equal is because when you're with an equal, there is something about that that cannot reasonably lead to hierarchy. And uh, hierarchy is the situation that we've had in families uh, until just recently. And so we want to do families now without a lot of hierarchy. I mean, with, with ch little children, we need hierarchy. And that's a whole other, that's another sort of chapter, a different subject, so to speak. But when it comes to love between equals, we're trying to do that without abuse, without oppression, and with this open inquiry. So consequently, in order to work with the issue of projection and what's called projective identification, which is a big term in, you know, uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy. Um, it's more or less what projective identification means is you create a scapegoat and the scapegoat starts to identify with that identity. I'm not good at this or I'm defective in this way. Then you try to manage the scapegoat and pretty soon you've created hostility and animosity. And so that, that problem of projective identification is the way we create enemies in the world all around us. It is not just in couple relationship, but if we can work through that in a couple relationship, in a relationship with an equal, get skillful, feeling our own feelings, being able to manage our own internal situation so that we can keep an inquiry open, then we don't have to subjugate dialogue. We can have two people, two subjectivities, really in relationship to each other even when they're different, even when there's tension, even when there's pain, even when there's dying, even when there's all sorts of things, there's the possibility of staying in touch. Now, this is the last sort of little segment here of my spiel about love in the 21st century, which I actually think is quite promising, even though it requires owning up to your brokenness. Um, I, and, and all of us too. If we can make that move from falling in love, uh, which is you know, taking love personally, to that position of actually deeply accepting the other person as that person is, then we've got this arc of what I call true love. It's, it goes from the idealization, the falling in love, the elevation thing, through the disillusionment, the power struggle, the difficulties of trying to see each other, into that sense of a deep commitment to the other person's otherness and to the recognition of 
I usually use smoking because smoking is like the biggest crime on earth these days. You know, if the if the other person smokes, that you deeply accept being you're willing to live with the smoking because you love this person, and that to me is some sort of transformation of the human spirit. I mean, I think if we can do this kind, if we arc, then I think we we have some promise for going out into the world and handling things out there because. We can say, okay, you know, I can actually accept the people that I love. I can accept them because I see what is so precious and particular and important about that individual that even if that person does an awful lot to bug me or to even put me at risk sometimes, I'm going to stick with it. It's a spiritual practice. And that's when love becomes a spiritual path, when it moves from that to that. So. That's, that's my spiel. <laughs> that's a whole lot to unpack. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit, I, I think, maybe first about the enemy thing. Let's talk about the enemy thing. How, uh, does that resonate with anybody in the room? That, you know, you can really love someone and be with them and, and you know, you, you feel like the person you love becomes your enemy? You just raise your hand. Yeah, I'd like to know how you go from beloved to enemy within a matter of minutes. <laughs> Is that a, is that a question? Have you been there? Oh, I've been there. Okay. Okay. But it is very true how you said that. You can have someone as your beloved, you put them on the pedestal, and once you put them on that pedestal, there's only one way down, and it's that. Mm -hmm. What would you guys say to that as a couple, having worked on your marriage, and, and been, these guys have been together for about 12 years, and I know that you've been very conscious and with really loving mm -hmm. intention to build a... a, a a long-term relationship. What, what would you say to him or about this? How you go from the He's beloved asked, to the yeah. enemy? So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. I I don't know what it is, but it does. Yeah, it happens fast, obviously. And I think because maybe the I mean the the underlying emotion is really strong, like of obviously a lot of love and affection, but that also can lead to a lot of disenchantment and and anger because you're not getting maybe the love that you know you want you know that that's what happens like you go from that intense affection and then all of a sudden it's it just gets really ugly fast but i feel like for me i, I mean i'm just hearing what paulie's uh, what the whole thing that you were talking about just the amount of um self-awareness and work that it takes on oneself to know what your triggers are or what your projections are so it can happen so quickly because it's so unconscious yes. you know it's such an unconscious reaction to patterns yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, and I have found in our marriage that the more work I've done on myself the work we've done in couples therapy is that I'm just much more aware of there's more sp there's more awareness around it so when those things happen there's like a pause and an ability to be like here it is again. Like, I have a choice in managing how I'm going to respond to this in the moment. Well, you could say you take it personally. <laughs> you know, you really do take it personally because it's striking something that is very deep within you that is a pattern that you laid down in earlier relationships and that she isn't really fully responsible for. But she's striking something in a particular moment. It's very painful. It's very painful, and most people then try to control it by controlling the other person. And usually that's the moment when this thing snaps. If you're trying to control yeah. what the other person is doing, we don't like that as equals. We don't like it. And whether you're you know, a grown-up child of somebody, or you're, you're talking to a sibling, or most painfully to a spouse, or a partner who is supposed to know you personally, who is supposed to keep in mind, oh, she really doesn't like this kind of tofu. You know, I'm supposed to know that. And then when you offer her the tofu, it feels like, wow, don't you know? I, that's not what I like. Uh, I mean, once I saw a couple where, you know, the guy gave uh, his vegan wife a fur coat for Christmas, honestly. Uh -oh. Yes. <laughs> It was, oh. it was very difficult. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about this, Walker? Well, you know, it makes me discouraged but, but hopeful that, that I can 
work with this, continue to work with this, and hopefully get a little better at it while being gentle with myself. You know, I, I recently, just in the last uh, six or seven months, went through the end of a relationship. And I would say that during the last three to four months of it, uh, I, was, I was projecting constantly. And I was trying to control the other person. Uh, and I knew, I was aware that I was projecting, that I was being triggered. I was aware of how controlling I was being. I was aware of how, just how goddamn codependent I am. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't stop and I'd catch myself and again and again I'd come away saying to myself, okay, there must be a way that I can actually control my behavior and I couldn't and I failed and I failed and I failed and I failed. Um, now, you know, in retrospect, I give myself a little bit more slack because it's so hard. And, and I think, you know, I tried to walk that line uh, both in the months leading up to the end of the relationship and also when it ended, I really tried to consciously walk that line between uh, not blaming, not, um, you know, not taking care of myself and, and at the same time uh, having strong, healthy boundaries. You know, I, I really tried to find that happy medium between not closing, not shutting down, not closing my heart, but at the same time having strong, healthy boundaries. Absolutely, and, yeah. and it's interesting because what you're saying ties right in with what Liza was talking about when she was saying, you know, I need to look, at, t take a pause and look inside and mm -hmm. ask myself, what are my triggers? What's inside me that's, that's making this hard for me? Uh, we both have done a lot of work around uh, not having that just uh, reactivity um, so quickly. You're making this, this is your fault that you're doing Right, it. and so then what happens is it gets explosive because maybe I do something that triggers Liza, and then her reaction, which can be really strong, makes me, I take that personally, kind of like, oh my God, like, wow, well, she hates me, or this is like, yeah. really like, what, how, what horrible thing have I done, or how horrible a person I am. And, and, and now, I mean, you've gotten a little better, like you've talked about being able to step back a little bit and say, okay, I see where this is coming from, mm -hmm. and why yeah. I, this response came about, and it's not, not to take it personally all the time. I'm, I'm sure you would agree, right? Reactivity is one of our biggest problems <laughs> in the world, really. I mean, it's a... Well, we, we even what is that reactivity? I like the way Walker was talking about mm -hmm. he was actually experiencing something in himself, mm -hmm. but in the end, he wasn't able to sustain the sense of caring for himself and his bond with his partner. You know, you could sustain the two of those together. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that the biggest reactivity that is so difficult is the feeling of humiliation. Mm. When you feel that someone else is being contemptuous towards you, and then you feel humiliated or you could say um, enraged. Because mm -hmm. humiliation and enrage uh, are kind of the two sides of the same coin. And uh, if you know any of uh, John Gottman's research on couples, he says the main thing that is going to predict the end of the relationship is contempt. Yeah. And so if, you're, if you have the experience that your partner is conveying scorn or contempt, or if the partner is conveying scorn and contempt, which can be conveyed pretty unconsciously by a slight rolling of the eyes or a little bit of flick of the head, when you feel that pain, that I think is one of the biggest reactivity things. Yeah. And that's where all of whatever emotional skills you have, whatever mindfulness skills you have or whatever, whoa, you have to actually work hard. Mm -hmm. Work hard with yourself. And then also to repair that sense of trust, to trust the other person. Um, because often we feel like we're between a rock and a hard place, like we don't wanna lose be this person because it's very painful to go through grief. It doesn't matter what the reason is, grief is painful. 
but it's also painful to lose somebody that you have actually studied for a long time, you know, where you know the particularity of that, you know the person's habits, you know what, you don't want to lose all that traction that you've gotten from, you know, a kind of working through all of that. You've taken the training, you know, and now you want the results. Um, and so you're between the place of the loss and then the feeling of, wait a minute, can I be true to myself here? This is so humiliating, you know? And so I think that level of reactivity is the hardest one. Almost all of the other ones are, are, are easier. I, I'm not gonna get into the specific behavior mm -hmm. that was triggering me, but I'll say that I took his behavior as contempt mm -hmm. and I fed that contempt right back to him. And so now, as I'm sitting here and you're talking about contempt, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, his behavior, what he was doing that was triggering me, um, had nothing to do with contempt for me. And yet I took it that way personally, mm -hmm. and I hated him for it. Yeah, 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 well, you're not alone. I mean, yeah. I suppose I feel this like a 12 step or something. Yes, I did that yes. too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, mean, yes. I, mean, I, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. the, the skill that it takes to work with that is high, high level skill, you could say, you know, because what has to happen is you have to see your partner in context. You have to see, at some moment, it's almost like looking through the other end of the telescope, you know, you kind of, you, you, re you realize this person had this childhood, had these things going on, suffered this kind of trauma and so on. And so this person at this moment is contextualized in this whole big thing. And perhaps I'm picking up this as contempt towards me, and maybe even it is at this moment, but is it possible to see this person in this bigger framework the same way I might see my neighbor, or mm -hmm. I might see you know, somebody that I don't feel so painfully and personally mm -hmm. connected mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. and, and that is difficult to do, it's yeah. not. You had something to say too. Yeah, uh, I'm not like quite sure how I'm gonna ask this, but I'm gonna try. Um, you talk about re uh, reactivity, and you also talk about other, which I think is a really interesting phrase, especially because a lot of the time when you're talking about somebody who is other than you, it is someone who's separate than you, and in this context you're using it, uh, it's a good thing. And I think, and I'm, what I'm trying to figure out and wrap my mind around is like, is the crux of the theory that if you can recognize that like the, you, you put someone in, in a contextualized place, right? You in, in your life, they are a piece of you. But if you can say you are a piece of me, but you are also someone else, you are also an entirely different human who is never going to be perfect, and I am never going to be perfect, and we can be not perfect together. And just simply recognizing that will make it so you, you won't react so poorly when something goes wrong. It'll just kind of, you'll be able to roll over those bumps easier. Is that? That's is that the idea. Of? That's, That's the, the idea. idea. And you get better and better at it as you move along, hopefully. You know, or or you start with somebody else again, or something like that. Um, yeah, it's it's really exactly the way you put it. You're contextualizing the other person as a separate person with a history, with feelings and beliefs, and so and desires, um, who who at that moment can't mirror you at all, and who also uh, maybe has already hurt you many times but you still are interested. You're still wanting to see more and know more, uh, even if it's painful at this moment. Uh, that's kind of the idea. Yeah. Uh, this, you know what this is, is making me think of is how often I've heard from friends or clients or, or people that I know um, talking about how they feel like they lose themselves in relationship. Mm. Yes, he has not. Yeah, yeah. How we feel like we we lose ourselves, and because I was thinking about Liza speaking about going back, going inward, and, and knowing myself. Um, you know, I really like, especially in my early twenties and through my thirties, relationships were really about, and not just love relationships, but friendships, all relationships, work relationships. It was like I had to. My idea was like, in order for this to last. I had to abandon myself over and over. And so a lot of my learning has been about, wow, I can actually have a voice. I can set boundaries. I can know what I feel. Um, and I can risk loss. Like, I'm going to be OK, too, um, because 
sometimes it doesn't work out. It's, I think, also a bit confusing because in our, at least in my parents' generation, there was, an ex there was no expected friendship between the two people who were married. My mother's friends were uh, women, and they were her sisters and other people from her extended family. And my father had friends through the church and through his work. And my mother didn't really like him much. Uh, and she made it really clear over a long period of time, like 51 years, and uh, um, at least all the time that I was a witness. And, uh, but that wasn't a problem because it wasn't personal. They got married in the church. They were staring married. And like George Harrison's wife said, uh, you know, the secret to a long marriage is don't get divorced. You know, uh, and that was, the, uh, that was the way that things used to be not so long ago. And it's overlapping with our lives a great deal. So now there's this whole other thing like you have to retain your sense of autonomy, respect yourself, actually be able to care for yourself, look into yourself, and then there's this other person. You know, and this other person that you've invested a lot in. And so it has to actually be both ways. The interest in the other and the care for the other and the interest in the self and the care for the self. And this takes skills that I don't believe most people, I would say nobody had these skills. These are new kinds of demands that are made on us. And if we put them in the context of the old traditions, we just feel inadequate because people used to stay together for 50 years. And you know, it, it seemed like they just kind of took it in stride. And now here we are, supposedly more thoughtful, more psychological, and so on. And you know, we're breaking apart all the time. Uh, and I don't think myself it's because some people, some pundits would say, well, we're demanding too much of personal love. You know, we're demanding too much. We're putting too much of a load on it. I actually think we've shifted our ideas, but we haven't shifted our skills. Like, it's like we really do want a mirroring relationship. We want a good friend at home. But to get there, we're going to have to travel a path that nobody has traveled yet. And so we're sort of pioneers on that path. And if we get a little better at it, and we build it step by step, we don't condemn ourselves, I think we can keep going. But it is confusing yeah. because there's this feeling like if you respect yourself, you should get out now. And there are times when definitely you should get out. I mean, definitely if there's violence and or if there's a lot of addiction, there's a lot of stuff that's really harmful. Yes, protect yourself. But uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's the skill of loving yourself as a particular being caring for yourself, but also being able to do that for another particular being who is also broken and so on. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> you talk about it's a skill set. And we didn't learn that growing up. We didn't learn that in kindergarten or college or anywhere. We, if you were lucky enough to be a psych major, you know, you might have been of, of approached this. But the rest of us didn't develop it as a skill set. And I do think you're right. It's new. We're trying for something better, and we're trying for something big. And a lot of people think we're just full of baloney. But we're not. <laughs> and a lot of the world still has arranged marriages and a hierarchy in the home. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, you think about it, I mean, like, most of us, I think we look at our own parents and our, their relationship, and you're like, oh, that's kind of screwed up. I'm not doing that. <laughs> and then you see movies where in Hollywood it's all like, oh, this is this wonderful, like, you know, odd, strange courtship, and it's kind of... And then it's a fairy tale and happily ever after. And there's very little communication or modeling, I think, of like a real relationship, a real marriage. I can't think of like parent, you know, people growing up who had kind of like a, a relationship that you were like, okay, that's real. Yeah. They're like, you know, they're fighting and sometimes they're really together and, and there's real problems that they're working out. Um, so you grow up with those either those extremes and you don't know how to kind of thread the middle. I mean, I don't think it's possible without therapy, but that's just me. I mean, I just don't think it's possible. I, I kind of agree with you, but I don't like to say that because I work as a therapist. I, feel I don't like know how we get those tools without having role models. I mean, I just think of how much it's helped us, certainly, but also to be able to really unpack the things that are like, you're really do this and you do it because of, you know, you're trying to make me feel, you know, this thing. And then to really like sit with a third person, you know, a witness and say, let's like unpack this a little bit more. 
And a adding on to what, what you said, um, we're not even taught that we're conscious beings when we're young people, that there's a part of us that can step away and observe what we're thinking and how we're acting. And I think to begin integrating uh, this whole new skill set until hopefully one day maybe it becomes second nature, I don't know. And it's hard. I think we have to just remember that, that um, it's, it, it, I mean, I, you know, I would call you and talk to you and you would say the same thing. You would say, you know, this is hard. This is really hard. And you know, you're doing your best. Yeah. To go with, to your point where you're saying not to be so hard on yourself, I try to say, have, okay, have some faith in yourself that actually this probably may mm -hmm. not be a terrible moment. Have mm -hmm. some faith that you could go, kind of breathe, go inside, and know why this really is getting you. Mm -hmm. Or know why you feel like there's a power struggle. And, and have a good instinct about yourself. Trust mm -hmm. your instinct mm -hmm. that you don't have to go in there and tear anybody apart and defend yourself. That's you don't have to defend mm -hmm. yourself, you know. Um, and to have some faith and then to work, use that. Uh, use that as a tool. Because when you're not beating yourself your up, potential. Mm -hmm. you're not beating anyone else up. Yeah. Yes. This is how we are. No one is out to get you. They're just being themselves. And you take it in a way, you talk about taking it personally. I think the, oftentimes the intention is not they know who I am and they're doing this because they, they, they're trying to get me or hurt me or anything. I think they're just being themselves. And then we take it as an offense or as, a, as, as punishment or as they're vindictive in some way. But what I'm trying to see is this idea of separateness, which I think is so important, is they didn't mean to hurt me. They were just being who they are. And the other thing is it's maybe not their responsibility to make you feel uh, sexy and smart and all of that. Maybe we're supposed to feel that ourselves and then bring that to the relationship because that's a terrible burden to put on someone to say, make me whole. That's looking for a nurse that's not looking for a relationship, perhaps. But that does I'm... happen when you fall in love. Yeah. Yes. You know, when you fall in love, you have the usually the feeling, whether it's with a baby or with a beloved over there, that that person's going to complete you in some way, is going to mirror you in some way, is going to be a better you in some you know, whatever. Yeah. That is a part of falling in love. And the thing is that there's a way that we, I, I do believe as a culture, we're heavily invested in romance, yes. you know, American culture. I, again, I don't say that critically. I just think it's a fact. And if we recognize it, maybe we'll say, okay, that's part of the load that we're carrying is that we all have this idea that romance is wonderful and it is intoxicating. However, there's this other aspect to it if you believe that your partner actually knows you well and then gives you a mink coat for Christmas and you're a vegan, you know, it feels insulting and it takes a lot to unpack that because it's hard to pull that apart. So it, it's, you know, theoretically, yes, I can say, you know, you're not supposed to make me whole or, you know, you're not supposed to actually, you know, endorse my uh, political point of view or whatever. But when the rubber hits the road, it doesn't, uh, it's not an easy thing, you know, and that's, yeah, that's the work, right. There's very little modeling for that. There's very little modeling. There's a lot of modeling for romance. There's, there's and as you were saying, little. the end of the movie is they go off into the sunset, and that's the beginning of the that's work. That's the beginning, But there's not a yeah. lot of films and books about the day after the marriage. That's right. After yeah. the that's wedding. That's right. And right. that's hopefully the longer part than the before the wedding. Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, this is also like the age of Facebook and Instagram and all this yes. stuff. It's like we only see the best parts of everything. And, and I'm thinking of this like 50% divorce rate, which in one hand is kind of like, wow, that's it's a little more than 50%. But <laughs> like, okay, like you were saying, it's sort of a healthy sign that people are not feeling so like they have to stick in something for so long. On the other hand, I feel like it's a real like statement about our culture. Right, and that's, yeah, yeah that's like why. When was the last time you saw someone's Facebook post and they were just like, oh my God, I just had the worst fight, you know? know. And she just walked out and, and my, our kid is screaming. I don't know what to do. You never see that. It feels like love <laughs> is this story. really like this tending to like a garden. Like it's a ten it's a tending to something yeah. that's it's over like years. a garden. It really is, and it, and it like Susan was saying too. I mean, it's it's something that you have to work for, 
and we just now getting the tools. And I don't think the 51 you know, percent divorce rate is a great thing, but I think that it's an indication of how hard it is. I, what I wouldn't like to see, I wouldn't really at this moment love to see the prison you know, sort of metaphor for love return, mm -hmm. which is you're stuck here for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. even though I know a lot of the world operates that way. I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that this, this path of personal love is for everybody, I, it, it, but it's what's happening here in the 21st century. It's difficult if we can forge ahead, if we can do this thing and work with the enemy thing and make it back into this is my friend and this is I'm interested and this is another you know hurting human being if we can do that possibly we can open a path for something about working with hatred hostility and enemies in a general framework or the other part of it is if we don't we're a pretty narcissistic group of people that are going to fail in our families yeah. you know I mean that's the other way that all this could go which is that we just keep breaking up and being alone and not being able to include people in our lives and it could go that way i mean i, I don't think there's uh, i'd love to see it go the other way but it's so you know. how do we forge that path from wow this person that i love is now feeling like an enemy to this person's really my dearest friend what is somebody the in the back to? there yeah <laughs> relationships friendships work situations change but it's really important to realize that there's no sense of the sense of other that this person is not the person I married my sister's really different but that as they're evolving are we really taking the time to get to know people in this really busy world we live in so I think that's very important talking about how also we're changing and evolving um, just just in our lives and with any people we're dealing with how we can become so attached to what was or attached to the idea we had about that person or we stay attached to the idea we want to have about that person and then actually we're disappointing and disillusioning ourselves because we're so attached to our idea. So that that's also a, a big thing I think, right? To well, appreciate that we evolve together. And well, the, everything is always actually right. impermanent All but it's hard to kind of catch on to that um, because it's painful also. But uh, if you think of that, that in the end, you know, what you're talking about is like two people as kind of whole self. Whole self here, I'm going to pay attention, make sense of myself, whole self over there as well. And, and my husband got early onset Alzheimer's. And so at the age of 54, he began to decline into Alzheimer's. And the book that I wrote, called it, the one called The Present Heart, is a memoir about that. And honestly, that is a, an extremely difficult thing to watch that change and then try to figure out how are you going to stay connected to someone who's becoming a child. And this, this person is reversing. It's, it's like the curious case of Benjamin Button. This person is becoming an infant and I'm becoming a mother to somebody who was my lover, who was my best friend for many, many years. And um, I don't think there's a formula for it, but I do know it's possible. And that the way that it's possible is what you said. You stay interested, you stay engaged, but you also stay in contact with yourself and you try to see this other person as the person is. And so, you know, when, when, when my husband was essentially four years old, I could not have a full relationship as I had had with him previously. I had to then have a life of my own and still take care of him because he still needed me. So this, this idea of staying in touch with another person who's changing is something that is a really, really big, again, I would say spiritual challenge uh, that teaches you so much, but is profoundly interesting if you can stick with it. And sometimes you can't. And, and then if you, you know, don't blame yourself, I mean, because you're just a regular person, you know, and, and like the other <laughs> regular people around you. But uh, if you can follow that path, it is kind of a, it's a kind of a new path always to get to know the person again mm -hmm. and to stick with it. Uh, but again, I, I don't, I mean, I feel like on this personal love path, it, it's not like there's one single solution. Curiosity, connection, 
and hold self to hold self if you want to stay together. But if you need to break apart, then the forgiveness of yourself and of the other person, and the going on with your life, you know. It's, uh, it's, but it's, it's uh, to stay together and to do this in a way that, that covers many, many years. Uh, it really does take that openness to the connection, to the curiosity with the changes. How do we work on these things without being in therapy? What, what do we do? I mean, we're talking about some, some ways, even if they're small ways, like take a breath first, yeah. I am in the dating world right now, and I find a lot of men that I meet say, I don't want equal partnership. That takes a lot of work, and I don't want to do the work. So that's the why. Like, what's the reason that you want to do that work? That's the first question you have to, to ask, because that's the glue. That's what's going to keep you motivated to do the work. So I'm curious what the why is for each of you on the couch, for everyone in the room. And then I think you talk about the how. Well, I mean, I'm, I would say one reason is that a lot of loss is really painful. And if you have, if you lose relationship after relationship, you know, you fall in love and you have this romance and you get close and then you lose it and then you lose it again and you lose it again, pretty soon you do not want to go out there. And uh, isolation is very difficult. We're very social beings, you know, and when we want to punish people at the highest and the highest way, we put them into solitary confinement. And we don't recognize that this is very, very painful for humans. So to go about your life without a close friend, without close others, this is very painful. And so I think that underlying motivation is to actually not have so much loss and to be in contact. And I think everybody honestly wants that. But people give up because it's so difficult. And after a while, it just seems tiring. And you meet a bunch of other tired people, too, you know, if they say, boy, I gave up on that a while ago. Yeah, you know? and it's most especially if you meet men at the age I am now who are, have been married before, they've got kids, they're running a business, and they're like, I already put so much work into my life as it is. I don't. I, I agree. And I mean, I, I, you know, I actually am very much a person who favors people being together. And so I work hard to try to bring that about. And yet in my own life, I've also had to ride that whole thing of a lot of divorce in my, and, and in my children's families also. I mean, it's like, whoa, that's, that's a lot of pain. And some people say, well, why should we even try then? because you know, we know it's going to be painful. Uh, I, I just think that the isolation is worse. You know, yeah, I mean, the... for me personally, I, I've always gone back and forth. I've had divorces as well in my life, and I've always gone back and forth in my adult life with, I really love being alone. I just want to be alone. I love it. I love having my house the exact way that I kind of want it. And my, <laughs> dog goes to sleep the same time I do, and there's no noise, we wake yeah. up a certain way, and I, I actually mean this, yeah. this is no, yeah. this is, no. I mean this, yeah. and I'm, you know, and I'm like, this is fantastic, and I go out on the balcony, and I talk, you know, what's up with my friend in South America, this is just great, and and then, you know, I get go through the period where, well, yeah, but I really, I want to be close to somebody, I, I do, I want to love some. I want to be in a loving relationship, and then, you know, I've gone that route, and then in, in my life, you know, that maybe that didn't go well, and I, I thought this is not happy for me, and I was again on my own, and and depending on depending on the situation or the, the relationship, let's say it was a, a good relationship, pretty much, that that ended up not working out, but that went on for a long time. There were wonderful benefits to that, you know. There's that feeling of partnership. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a family to me now, and still to this day, this person feels like family to me. I would, you know, I haven't even really spoken to him very much in 15 years, but I, I would, if he called me in trouble, I would help him, you know. And that, for me, that feeling of kinship and I care for you, and we did these things together, and you embraced my child, and I, you know, I tried with your kids or whatever they are. So there were there were all those those were the whys for me. That wonderful like mm -hmm. I trust you, like I. You're my person. There's a, there's a theory out there, I think um, Harville and Gay Hendricks write about this, mm -hmm. that relationships teach you about yourself. And unless you 
learn the lesson or master the lesson, you'll continue coming up against the same issues again and again in the same relationships. Of course, every relationship has something different to teach, I think. But, you know, that's a whole philosophy of relationship. I think it's called Imago? Imago. Imago. Imago? Yeah. Really interesting. I, mean, I, I was alone for a long time before I met Liza. And a lot of it was that, yeah, that you recognize that, you know, besides falling in love and the somebody special who just sparks something in you, but wanting to, uh, to I, that, that you know that somehow innately, even if you're not consciously thinking about it, that to be continue on your own, it's going to be a little bit like one dimensional or almost two dimensional, and you want to be able to like kind of not just share the journey with somebody, but bounce, you know, learn more about yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I certainly I love Between Equals was my attempt to write a map, yeah. was actually to try to map some of that path, mm -hmm. and coming out of actually writing um, the present heart. Because in going through um, love with somebody who has early onset Alzheimer's, what happens is that his subjectivity was just being erased. His memory was being erased, his ability to hold me in mind. And as, you know, as illness shows you what health is, uh, when the subjectivity of another person is being erased, you gradually see what was valuable, which was as essentially the witnessing, that close witnessing, somebody who is the sort of curator of your museum, so to speak, you know? Um, but then when that drops away, you realize nothing can replace that. There's nothing else like that. There isn't, you know, even just having a good friend or whatever, because this person has been an intimate witness. And uh, it was the erasing of it that sort of awakened in me, oh, this is what love is. It's not desire, it's not pleasure, it's not attachment, it's not romance, it's this thing. And, uh, and maybe that will help, is to try to say, how can we sustain that over time without beating ourselves up? So, I mean, hopefully uh, Love Between Equals will be something like that kind of map. And, um, um, you know, I would also like to think that not everybody has to go to therapy. I mean, I, I just think there are, yeah. <laughs> there's not enough therapy out there. Is, is this a craft you think most people can learn? Can people learn this? Yes, I believe they can. I, I actually, you know, I've worked with couples since 1982. I've worked with couples and individuals and blah, blah, blah. And actually, once people see what the issue is, uh, there are many, many people who uh, are just open-hearted. I mean, then they, they come to see what it is. I mean, and they do it. I'm always amazed at watching yeah. couples change yeah. and seeing that difference from that first meeting when many hateful things are said yeah. to a time where there's real tenderness. Uh, I've seen that. I assume you have, too. I have, too. I mean, there are some times in my office I have to say, when we've been talk using the word contempt, if I, you know, if I see major contempt over and over. I don't have a lot of uh, hope for that situation. But if I see glimmers of, you know, wanting to learn something or someone listening, someone just stopping, stopping to listen, you know, and maybe that's because there's a third person in the room, but just listening. Or, or like Polly's saying, witnessing. I think, I think we use the word witnessing, and, and I, I, I really love being reminded of that mm -hmm. term. Because you know, we it, also we fly by and do so many things so fast, and I'm I'm a kind of a fast-thinking person. But really, witnessing somebody isn't mm -hmm. just sort of seeing, oh yeah, there you are, you're my husband, you you do this, you look that way. But really, witnessing is also kind of seeing someone and kind of in a way remembering mm -hmm. all those things that are inside them, mm -hmm. or that pain that you saw three weeks ago, or that disappointment that you felt from that person, you know. You really witness them, and I find that's a tool actually to mm -hmm. actively witness mm -hmm. because it helps me to be more present. And then I feel like, oh, that's the guy that I'm in the room with, actually. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I love that guy. <laughs> like, I yeah. I just really never don't want to wake up in the morning without him. If I could practice that witnessing, for example, in an active way, or if we could practice things like we hear the word compassion. And mm -hmm. what I do a lot in my workshops is talk about, you know, it's not just a condition or a state. It's a, it's a thing you can act. It's mm -hmm. active. Practice compassion. Mm -hmm. Practice mm -hmm. compassion. And that goes such a long way 
even just in your personal relationships, it's not a, it's not a global thing, it's global too, but you know, really make that active. You will see without the dirt on your glasses, you know? And I have, like I'm thinking, just reflecting on what you're saying and the why is like, um, marriage kind of kicked me in the ass spiritually. Like, I was a long time meditation practitioner. I was a long time yogi. I could go on retreats. Silence was never a problem. I had deep states of meditation. I mean, I really thought I was doing pretty well. Like, <laughs> and, you know, and I'd been in and out of relationships. I actually dated long time meditation practitioner. Um, it was really marriage that was like, boom, like, like, I mean, we fell in love. There was, you know, <laughs> there was enough, there was a lot there and certainly enough projections too, but there was something. And then it was like, oh my God, all this, these years of thinking I'm so insightful and compassionate and, and then it was like, no, like the work, the work at this huge blind spot, the healing, I guess that's maybe to the why, like the healing that can come, the reparative uh, aspects of, re of relationship and um, the life force of connection. I just feel like as humans, that's, it, it is a life force um, and uh, it's worth tending to, I guess, yeah. you know, and, and I love that you write about it as a spiritual practice because the word marriage and I mean, I have to be honest, like it's like, I don't know, like maybe I'm not cut out like mar like in the sort of stereotype of how we know it, but marriage as this idea of like, you know, I've escaped enough times, like I've gone down this road enough times to know like what the end result, you know, mm -hmm. but here I am with somebody willing to work on it with mm -hmm. me that it's worth it, you know, it's worth learning, learning the skill, I guess. Um, but it, maybe that's an individual for each person of what the why is? Well, yeah, I mean, sure. I, I, sure. but I think there is a kind of universal aspect to the benefits that one gets by being able to live with somebody over time through that changing thing and to uh, be able to have that connection to a specific person. It's like a specific spiritual practice. You know, you don't just flit around to a whole bunch of them. You do something and you get good at it. Mm -hmm. And I do think being with a person is like a training. You get to know that person. Um, and well, I was thinking though, the whole time I've been wanting to quote Leonard, uh, you know, gather up your brokenness and bring it to me now. Mm -hmm. The fragrance of those promises you never dared to vow. The splinters that you carry in the cross you left behind. Mm -hmm come healing of the body, come healing of the mind. He has so many wonderful lines, but he never could do the love thing. And he said, you know, I can sit in meditation 10 hours a day at a Zen retreat. I cannot wake up with a witness every day. It's too hard. It's too hard to look into somebody's face who really knows me well. And he figured that out about himself because he had a kind of brokenness that didn't work. But it is really harder than doing the 10 hour a day Zen retreat. I mean, because there, at least, uh, no matter how much, you know, the aches and the pains and so, the person doesn't look at you and say, uh, would you like a fur coat? You know, I mean, <laughs> when you are vegan or whatever. I mean, it's like you, you don't get that personally disappointed in when you're in these long meditation retreats. It's not personal. You know, you can just kind of move through and you don't get that shaken up, even if it's hard. And I think that sometimes people um, don't really make the distinction, you know, open heartedness is, it, it's like, you know, when Brene Brown was originally yes. talking about vulnerability, right. you know, she was saying that when she interviewed people about vulnerability, none of them liked it, mm -hmm. but they realized they needed it mm -hmm. to have a full life and to know love they needed vulnerability. And open-heartedness, I think, is one of the, the characteristics, too, of helping us mm -hmm. in relationship. But it feels really scary to be open-hearted to somebody else. Who could really hurt you, by the way? You know oh, yeah. immediately, wait a minute, this person could actually really hurt me or leave me, mm -hmm. you know? And, but in order, I, I think anyway, you know, in order to, to really 
follow love as a spiritual path, as mm -hmm. Polly says. I think open-heartedness is something we need to kind of learn to cultivate and even actually understand kind of what it is, how it feels, mm -hmm. and how it feels in our bodies too, our mm -hmm. bodies and our minds, and what does my heart feel like when I'm closing it? Do I even know when I'm closing it? What does it feel like when I opened it? What happens to me mm -hmm. when I open my heart? And definitely when you, when, you, when you take the path of love, it will break your heart also. There's no question. It's not like maybe this person will hurt. This person will hurt you. This person will. Either you'll leave this person or what, somebody's going to die. Somebody is going to do something, leave, get sick. It's not going to be a forever thing. So it will break your heart. And it's almost like a vow to, to break your heart that you're willing to do that in order to take this path in which you do learn a lot about being human and about being a witness. And it's, it's, it's really um, different from, I, I think, from developing other kinds of sk skills in the spiritual path. What do we feel about hard times? Like when we're really having hard times with our partner? And, and what do we think about this idea of hard times as a gift? We've heard mm -hmm. that a lot, right? We hear mm -hmm. that, we hear, you know, from, in our, in our yoga tradition, injury, when we have an injury, that's a gift, an opportunity to learn, or that hard times, mm -hmm. or that loss. Many spiritual leaders say, that's the time you're gonna learn the most. You will learn the most from loss. We don't learn the most from just going like this through our lives, right? So I'm interested in that, what you think about that idea of, the, is it a gift, the hard times in a relationship? And I think what I appreciate about Polly's work is that conflict is the path for intimacy. And I work with a, a, a wonderful teacher by the name of Joe Weston, who's written a book called Mastering Respectful Confrontation. Confrontation as a pathway to deeper relationship, d deeper intimacy. And what's so curious about the word confrontation is that it's, um, if you break it down into syllables, con, with, front, your heart, Asian, open, with an open heart, you're meeting somebody face to face. Conflict, on the other hand, is adversarial. Um, and we often think of them as being the same thing. So I think the, the beauty of, of confronting an individual is that, that that's where the vulnerability lies. That's where the possibility for, for, for transformation exists. And I think that's what your work, Polly, is, is, is all about. You know, a conflict will lead to confrontation if things go well, so to speak. Uh, and it's like <laughs> if you, you know, if, I usually say to people, if you want to get to know someone, go through a conflict. If you don't want to know them, back off from the conflict. And so many of our, um, you know, the old models for families would be to stay away from conflict. And uh, if, you, if you did family systems work or any of that kind of work years ago, it was pretty well known that if a family stayed away from conflict, they needed a scapegoat yeah. because they had to handle their differences some way. And so they had to, to put all of their difficulties into this one person and drive that person away. Mm -hmm. And then that person identified with being inferior, essentially. And so if you are going to avoid conflict, you will find a scapegoat. If you actually go through conflict, you have to do the confrontation. Mm -hmm. And then if you can do it with respect and you can keep the whole self and the whole self and so on, then, then it becomes a true intimacy because then you actually go through this, come out the other side, you see a different kind of person than you originally saw and maybe in yourself too. Um, and, but again, many people wouldn't know that. You know, They would think that if they have uh, and it is true, if you have a lot of unresolved conflict and you don't, you don't go through a negotiation or the confrontation, then um, it's likely you'll break apart. You know, uh, that's, that's true too. But uh, going through the conflict, doing a confrontation with respect, you come out the other side, you know the other person better. And that's true in all yourself. walks of life. Well. Yes, yeah, I've learned that like on a very deep level. I think. I mean, I, I've tended to, on, often to like avoid confrontation. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm not, I use confrontation instead of conflict, yeah. like you're saying yeah. with that. And you know, from my childhood and through, you know, up through my early adulthood and until we met, and and it, I've learned. You know, it's taken a long time to like the the, the benefits of like actually. Confront. That's not going to be the end of the world. It's not going to be like me, like 
you know, being humiliated or driven off or abandoned, but like actually to confront and the, the health, the healthy aspect of that, of us confronting each other over That's something. A hard, hard uh, lesson. Yes, it's <laughs> very hard, through. very hard to learn. Because I think I would feel I the sort of separate, the, you know, he ways. would go off um, and then I would just want to create conflict yeah. and confrontation. <laughs> Because I wanted to make contact. Yeah. I, I would be like, oh my know, God, she's going I just, crazy. She's yeah. like, I would, ah, oh, like the crazy. I, I am but, like the worst person in the world. And the more and I would God, do that, the more he like would run shit. because he was like, I can't deal with this yeah. craziness. And then the more he'd do that, the more crazy I'd, because I just wanted <laughs> contact of some kind. And the yeah. only way yeah. I learned to yeah. do it in my family was what I, what I would do. And, and so it was this thing we would get into and not understanding why for yeah. so, you know. No, like, and I would avoid so, that because I was my parents were like it was just like all about avoding conflict right. like right. god forbid and mine was about rage as a way of <laughs> <laughs> communicating so um, there we were like the avoider and the rage you know just yeah. like it's you know at least we're feeling something here even if it's not you know um yeah what a wonderful thing that you yeah. got together and you're <laughs> here with it's us so hard. And yeah. <laughs> So we're getting close to our ending time. Um, are there other thoughts that you're having that you'd like to bring up? Any questions? Yes. Hi. 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 Yes, I have a question. Uh, when you're in a partnership, Holly, is um, do you feel it's necessary for both partners to be cognizant of the process going on? Or can that be something one person brings to the relationship and then the other person learns from that person? You know, I, I think um, on the deepest level, it can be just one person. But most of the time, it's going to take two. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, a, because a system, I mean, the, there is a, you know, there are two people and there's a relationship. If you change one ingredient, like one person changes, it does change mm -hmm. the dance in the relationship. But um, that takes a very skillful dancer to, for the one person. Uh, and uh, uh, so many times I see with couples, there'll be somebody who is trying to actually change the dance and the other person's stuck in the old dance. Um, it depends a little bit that second person has to come along some. Uh, it's, it's like, uh, you know, you can invite and you can offer and then you can exhort and you can cajole, but you can't actually bring it all about yourself usually. But I, I used to feel like um, it could be just one person, and now I've come to feel that the other person does have to, in some way, come into it, or it starts to seem too humiliating. You know, it, it just the, the 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 person who's trying to bring about the change could get isolated, yeah. and can feel too defective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there needs to be a little bit of a the second person coming in too. I think. Anybody uh, else? Yes. What percentage would you say your upbringing, like you were saying before, I don't want to do what my father or mother did, I don't want to do that. What, the, the way you were brought up, what do you think that effect, long-term effect? You came from a broken home, divorced. What, what, what percentage would you say that affects the person, us, and your relationship? Does that have a big high percentage? It, you it think? affects you 100%, but that doesn't <laughs> mean that you can't do something with it. You know, it really is, a, it has a big effect. Yeah. But, uh, you know, all of us have a limbic system, we all have a hippocampus, and we all have parents. And uh, so, you know, it's like you got to start somewhere. And so I don't think anybody should feel that their, their past has somehow condemned them to something. Because nobody's good at this, we're all kind of beginners, and so, you know, I, I sort of feel like, uh, you know, you, you can do it, no matter what, where you started. I think that's a great place for us to end this wonderful discussion. And I just want to thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy lives and coming here tonight and um, for, this, for these wonderful people, Walker Reeland and Marcus Burns and Liza Toft, and the very wonderful colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you take away some new ideas about relationships. And don't forget what Polly said towards the end of the evening. We are all beginners. 
You can get better at this no matter where you started. Thank you so much for watching this. I'm Susan Lambert, host of this In The Balance live event, as well as the podcast series, In The Balance, connecting mind, body, and heart. For more information about Dr. Paula Young Eisendrath, the In The Balance podcast series, or any of our panelists this evening, please visit these websites. And as always, tune into our podcasts for more stimulating conversations with a wide cross-section of thinkers and doers.